Okay, now it's uh, twelve thirty in Stockholm, and uh, we're just about to go live with streaming streams. This first of uh, many events for our conference for the days to come and the year to come. Uh, my name is Jon Gardebo. I'm uh, one of the hosts and part of the stream team. And uh, soon I'll give the word um, to our professor Sverker Selin. Just briefly, I wanted to go through some of the functions that we'll be using throughout the days. Um, as you, so many of you have seen, we have the chat window, which you can find uh, in the uh, corner of your Zoom window. Uh, the chat window is good for sharing like, who you are, present yourself, affiliations, uh, even emails if you wish. Um, and uh, be sure also to um, address that to all panelists and attendees. Um, and that way everyone can see what you're writing. If you wish to write specific questions to us, that is to the guests or the moderator, uh, you should rather use the Q&A. And then you click on the Q&A um, and post your question. And you can also see other people's questions and um, uh, vote on them. So uh, if you want us to bring up a specific question or maybe modify that question, you can give it a thumbs up or uh, add your own comments. And then we'll review that as the sessions go on. Um, and uh, as always, if you have any specific questions apart from um, the meeting itself, you can always email us at streamsconference at kdh.se. That's uh, streamsconference at kdh.se, and you'll find it on the website. Okay, so it looks like we're about to start these three exciting days. Um, Sverker, would you be kind to give the opening words? Uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, good, to, good to have you all around, uh, friends of uh, environmental humanities, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to this uh, global event, uh, which is the first really and truly global open conference of environmental humanities. And at the same time, it isn't in a way because there have been many international meetings over the past decade and uh, uh, this isn't the major conference we had actually planned for because as you know, it is postponed until August 2021, the very same week as this week, next year. And you can read about that on the Streams uh, website. We had indeed between five and 600 participants already enrolled and close to 500 papers, artistic contributions, panel talks, etc. cetera. Uh, but that will be next year. But after all, it is because uh, all these international meetings so far have been fairly compact and specialized. Streams is uh, different and open for everyone and with all possible topics and approaches. And also uh, what we are starting this week is actually a part of Streams 2021 as well. It's only a first appetizer, but during the year more events will follow on this site that will give hints of what we can expect in a year from now. And lots of other things that we hope will happen on the site, interviews, podcasts, posted talks from elsewhere, conversations, and so on. We will hear more about those opportunities in the three days of sessions this week, but we are already quite a good number of participants that have joined this first day, more than 200. And uh, perhaps also some that wouldn't have been part of streams unless this opening streaming streams had been organized as a kind of ersatz for the real conference. Now, every cloud, as we say, has a silver lining, or in Swedish language, there is nothing really bad that doesn't also have a good side to it. And maybe this is the good side of postponing that we get all these side activities in the coming year. I just now would like once again to bid you all welcome to what promises to be a day of exciting activities. We have a wonderful program with many voices really worth listening to and having conversations with, and I will turn to those at the end. I should mention also that the program will be Zoom loose. Uh, that is, it is, will be a bit of slack uh, time-wise, so as to allow for everyone to take little breaks, relax, get a coffee or tea, perhaps a bite to eat. So when we start every session, we should be ready again with a solid appetite for next chunk of environmental humanities conversation. 
Uh, I am Sarkir Salin, and I was a co-founder of the Environmental Humanities Laboratory here at KTH in Stockholm in December 2011. My co-founder of that was uh, Nina Worms, an historian of technology and media, who is currently one of the three professors in this division. Uh, at that point in time, eight and a half years ago, we had just received a donation from a, an industrialist passionate about humanities, progress and reform. And uh, this donation made it possible for us in, in the Division of History of Science, Technology uh, and Environment, I'll say a little bit more about this division in a moment, to really start and institutionalize our activities in the environmental humanities that we had in earnest begun in a small way a couple of years before that. At that point, we could start to think about hiring a director for the lab. It turned out to be an economic historian from Naples, Italy, Marco Armiero, with a long career in several US universities, Kansas, Yale, Berkeley, Stanford, and in Barcelona, Spain, and Coimbra, Portugal. He came here in 2013 and has been an absolutely fabulous leader of the Environmental Humanities Lab since then. Uh, and um, so before um, returning to the program today and this week, let me give some very important information on why we are organizing this meeting. Two years ago, some 40 plus environmental humanities scholars from around the world, many who had emerged as leaders and pioneers of the field really, uh, but also a dozen PhD students enrolled in the first Marie Curie European International Training Network. We were all assembled in uh, the Schloss Hohenkammer, uh, less than an hour away from Munich in Germany. The Rachel Carson Center hosted the meeting and in, and in the Marie Curie program, also colleagues in Leeds and at KTH were engaged. Uh, the purpose of this exciting two-day meeting was to set uh, directions for the future of this burgeoning field of environmental humanities and look beyond 2020 into the new agenda 2030 decade. Was environmental humanities going to be better off uh, as a discipline? Should it remain a broad interdisciplinary enterprise? Should we think more about methodology or theory of the field or should we keep borrowing eclectically from other fields? Uh, many of these kinds of questions were discussed uh, during these couple of days. Back in 2012, our Australian colleagues had already started the Journal of Environmental Humanities taken over some years later by Duke University Press, and again with a set of institutional owners based in different countries. And we've seen other journals also setting out and several academic presses have started environmental humanities series over the last decade. So <clears> the <throat> question was asked, will we uh, need more organization uh, and, and consolidation of the field or how should we think about these things? Should we look at teaching programs? Should we consider <clears throat> uh, environmental humanities PhDs? Uh, uh, to what extent should the environmental humanities engage in societal impacts? Could or should it be an activist enterprise? What should be the relation between the field and policy, uh, the arts, communities, organizations. There were lovely, lively discussions around these topics, each and every one of them, of course, big enough. So a lot of talk about, in addition to the need to make sure that the scholarly work circulated across the breadth of the humanities involved. And precisely because of that, um, there was also a discussion about a certain lack of continuous conversation between different strands of environmental humanities that in fact were quite distant from each other. That also had been true of the formational years around 2010. Back then, crucial moves were made in very different disciplinary and topical terrains. Eco-criticism was one of those, and literary scholars articulated an interest in new kinds of humanities. Historians came forth with similar ambitions. So did religious scholars, anthropologists, and others. These large islands, if not continents, of scholarly activities 
sometimes had oceans in between themselves. This, despite they all pledging allegiance to a, a common cause and common name of environmental humanities. So how could all these different camps come together in earnest and en masse uh, and start an exchange and a conversation that hopefully could build continuity, uh, which would be probably necessary, regardless whether environmental humanities remained a loose conglomerate or if it moved into an ever stronger interdisciplinary union of some kind. Now the answer became uh, from these discussions that let's at least try to organize a cross-cutting, all-encompassing environmental humanities world conference. And I must admit that well ahead of the Schloss Hohenkammer meeting in July 2018, that was actually an idea that we had started to play around with a little bit here in the Environmental Humanities Lab in Stockholm. We had already organized a couple of fairly large conferences on related topics with up to 600 participants uh, each and a very strong young academic and activist participation, not least from the global south. And we thought we had some convening power in these groups that might be useful. So as the discussions mounted in Munich, we, Marco Almir and myself suggested the idea uh, boldly <laughs> as, as something the field should consider. Many agreed. And when the next question came uh, on who could actually take it on and do the work, uh, we, uh, we proposed that maybe why couldn't we also pursue it? Uh, looking ourselves in the eyes, I suppose, a little bit and, and, and said, let's try. And also by that conference, we were sort of given that mandate to carry the torch further and organize a, a conference like this. And in these two years, we have realized, uh, as many do, I suppose, it was easier said than done. Uh, uh, we started uh, early planning, thinking about dates, formats, ideas, quite a lot of work indeed. Uh, we wanted it to be out of the box, not just another big meeting, but new experimental formats, new ways of slicing the cake, so to speak, co-produced uh, co knowledge, multimedia, lots of art, film, and to some extent non-academic as well. And streams became our name. We inherited some ideas from meetings and took some inspiration really from meetings in the sciences where often self-organized major streams of sessions and activities build floating, often quite long lasting rivers in the conference landscape. You can go with it, go with the flow, you can drop off, you can slide into another one, but you can also choose to remain and build over several days or half days towards a more concerted uh, product than is usually the case in a conference with just ordinary paper sessions. The response to the call for um, proposals to streams was tremendous. We received more than 40 stream proposals. We ended up with some 25 after rejecting some and talking things through with others and a couple of mergers and, 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 and things like that. We hope these streams and their, um, their uh, crews, in a sense, will keep the energy up for another year and will come uh, uh, perhaps even better equipped in 2021 uh, for the real thing. In addition, of course, we have uh, more ordinary paper sessions. We have roundtables. We have lots uh, of various formats. And I will not go into more detail here. You have got the main message and there's more to read on the, on the web page. When we knew roughly what directions we wanted to take, we organized a large collaborative voluntary uh, organizing committee here in the division and the lab. Uh, plus we also asked some 25 or so experts from around the world to serve as a scientific committee and help us select among the proposals. Now, I would like to say really at this point that both these committees have performed superbly and diligently and they both remain in some limited service so to speak as we trod into a second year of preparatory activities and this is also the moment for me to thank all these people who have been engaged in the streams conference in in this important environmental humanities event uh, thank you warmly for for your work uh, now 
I mentioned this word again, the division uh, that is also involved, is, and it, it requires some explanation. And that is the case. Uh, our division of history here isn't just an ordinary history department with a lab as an attachment. It is more than that. We are a fairly large activity with some 50 people uh, enrolled, mostly research um, and PhD training. Uh, is what we do. And importantly, we are not just historians. We have increasingly built a diversity of humanities and non-quantitative social sciences, and to some extent, arts. We have in our faculty and, re and our research staff and among our PhDs, clearly a majority of historians, but we also have the old anthropologist, gender scholar, systems ecologist, physicist, geographer, literary scholar, and so on. Uh, who uh, align in this new home of theirs. Some have a background or a strong interest in film or uh, other arts. Some write in non-academic genres, essays, literary nonfiction, journalism, and so on. Now, being the major hub of humanities in a school of technology like KTH is not an option to build a range of disciplinary departments in the humanities. So what we do instead is to build integrative humanities very consciously like the environmental humanities. And we do that also because we wish to pool talent and resources in order to let humanities research address real world issues and challenges. That's really a mission we have. And this has served us fairly well so far. We have consistently, and especially since we founded the lab, been blessed with good fortune in our approaches to funding agencies. And here we see a certain logic. They also want uh, impact in society to happen. And that's a road we have taken. Now the jewel in that crown is really the environmental humanities lab, uh, which constitutes precisely such an integrative approach. Um, so the lab is embedded in the division, and while the latter is a history division, in practice we share uh, with the lab the same ambition to do integrative humanities and with a strong environmental and climate focus. It also made us, of course, very prone to become early adopters of the environmental humanities gospel when the trumpets started to sound. Uh, about a decade ago. In our foundational narrative of the field here in Sweden, we can follow the roots back to an initiative in one of the larger funders, the Foundation for Strategic Environmental Research, MISTRA, and the year 2007 actually, when MISTRA first hinted that they wished to see an ecological humanities, that's the term they used in the beginning, an ecological humanities effort, and said they would be even willing to fund it. Our own first organized idea in this division date from 2009 and our first international meeting uh, in this country was held in 2011. We co-hosted this with the Nordic Initiative for Environmental Research. So next summer it will be a full decade ago since we embarked on this enterprise. So um, this is a very short uh, answer in a sense to why we're here today and why we have this Stockholm connection. Uh, but as you could also note, nothing like this would have happened here or anywhere uh, unless it had been for all those smaller or larger aggregates of activities on all continents around the world, some of which were assembled at the Bavarian Schloss Hohenkammer. The entire field is maturing and growing and we are uh, here at KTH very honored and very humble that we have been entrusted uh, with taking this international meeting on. And we really hope the experience will be such that it becomes a recurring integrative activity of the field with more conferences over the years. Now, uh, finally, a few words about stock. Um, Stockholm is an unusually good venue for the environmental humanities to become truly international in a conference like this. We have seen the environment grow as a concern here in Stockholm since World War II. In, uh, and, and now I think we should actually turn to a little slideshow here that I wanted to show. Uh, and so, yes, could we have the slides? Mm -hmm. 
uh, and um, yep. So um, I'd like to start by saying that when you think about the environment uh, and its long history since the um, Second World War, I, I could say that I, I even myself wrote, wrote a book about that issue. Uh, you can see it in the middle here, uh, the environment, the history, the idea. And um, um, Stockholm is also a good, good um, uh, so we can have the next slide. Uh, the, um, this is the city of Stockholm and, and the place for this conference, the United Nations Conference, Only One Earth, back in 1972. And perhaps not a coincidence that it that, that happened in Stockholm because of the small power uh, serving as, a, as an ambitious uh, a broker between uh, bigger states and, and also sort of between East and West and so on. Next slide. And here we can see the Canadian oil man, Maurice Strong, who was the secretary general of that conference. Uh, and um, uh, next slide. It was also uh, uh, a couple of weeks in June 1972 of much uh, activism and activities. Many uh, groups gathered here in Stockholm and there were protests against, uh, uh, against the meeting actually and against the people in power. And uh, here is again Morris Strong coming out to meet the protesters in the outskirts of Stockholm in the night meeting. Uh, next slide. And uh, part of this was also the reorganization happening among the scientific community in, in Sweden and Stockholm. A new journal, Ambio, was started in 1972, the same year. It was a major transformation of the Academy of Sciences. The next slide. And uh, the Academy of Sciences turned out to be quite important over the long term. One of the influential people there was Paul Crutzen, who coined the word Anthropocene. Uh, here is seen close to the building of the, of the Academy of Sciences. Next slide. Uh, and you could say that what, what brings together, uh, makes Stockholm uh, uh, this hub of, of green and, and environmental activities has been an interest in high politics with institutions, government organizations, lots of civic activity, urban activism, protest movements, and also the strong presence of science getting things organized. Next slide. And here, I would like to emphasize uh, really one of the arch saints of uh, environmental activism in Stockholm, uh, Anna Lindhagen, who was an urban garden activist and founded the uh, movement of um, small urban gardens uh, that has been uh, alive and strong for about a century here. Next slide. Uh, here's yet another example of the, the uh, National Urban Park in Stockholm that was uh, decided by uh, the parliament in, in the 1990s after a long uh, period of uh, civic um, movements to uh, organize this. It's sitting right in the middle of, of, of the town and it's yet another sign of the activity. You can take the next slide. Uh, and uh, we could perhaps also note that the IPCC first president, Bert Bolin, uh, worked with Stockholm as a base uh, among the people in IPCC who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. Next slide. And his um, mentor and supervisor as a PhD student was this man, Carl Gustav Rossby, who had most of his career in the United States, but started talking uh, really back in the 50s already about climate change in the modern way. Next slide. He was also behind the jet waves, the jet streams that we feel when we're in the air. And uh, he was uh, again uh, linked back to the previous generation of Osvante Arrhenius, who wrote this famous paper in the 1890s of the, uh, basically with a modern um, orthodoxy of, the, of climate change. Uh, and you can have next slide. Uh, and next slide. Uh, we're a little bit in hurry here. So I will round this off by some recent contributions from these kinds of uh, communities of scientists in Stockholm. Uh, with the Planetary Boundaries article and uh, much important work in both the Stockholm Resilience Center and the Stockholm Environment Institute. So in a sense, we see ourselves here at the Environmental Humanities Lab as continuing on this uh, uh, trajectory, adding now uh, de decisively uh, humanities and social sciences to what was uh, foundations that were laid uh, earlier by the, by the sciences working for 
uh, long-term uh, uh, achievements of, um, of environmental uh, scholarship. With this, I wanted to conclude my introductory words here uh, and bid you once again welcome, warmly welcome to the um, three-day event here with streaming streams. And um, I leave the word, we could take a pause, don't we? Yeah, so we'll have a brief break of a few minutes, five minutes uh, before we will open with the next um, uh, point of the program, which will be a conversation between Roberta Piasillo here and Dipesh Chakrabarti. And Dipesh Chakrabarti, as we most of us know, uh, has been a very important uh, contributor to, to um, environmental humanities and uh, also to history and reflexive humanities, uh, first with his book, Deep Provincializing Europe, back in 2000, and uh, more recently with his work on um, theory of history and historiography and how history can be moved closer to uh, uh, more scientific approaches to, um, to our world and our uh, future. Uh, so see you back here in just a few minutes. Thank you very much for tuning in. <laughs>